Thank you. Thank you for coming. I hope you can hear me over the background noise. I have about 24 slides uh, to cover. I'm supposed to talk about precious metals and energy metals this year and beyond. And what I'd really like to do, my experience is that people like to ask questions. So I'm thinking that I, if it's, unless somebody raises their hand and objects, I'm going to try to go through my slides rather quickly uh, to give ourselves maximum time to talk. But let's see how that goes. Is that acceptable to everyone? To really allow ourselves to have some questions here. So if I can figure this one out, I'll choose, I'll use the right one. Here's my outlook for precious metals. I'll start with my outlook so that when I run out of time, you know what it is. Our view is that gold prices and silver prices will be relatively flat this year. Toward the second half of this year, prices may start to rise. We're looking for stronger prices in 2019. And then at some point in the next decade, probably six to eight years out, we think that prices will rise very sharply. And I'll tell you why in a second. Platinum and palladium are a little bit different. Palladium obviously has had a very strong run over the last 18 months and is at record levels. At some point, the palladium prices may come down. We don't expect them to come down sharply uh, simply because there are some good fundamentals. Palladium market is not nearly as tight as a lot of people say it is. There is a lot of palladium around there, but the people who own that palladium don't care to sell it in a rising market. If the price were falling, they might sell some, but with the price rising these days, they want to see how high it's going to go. So we think that palladium could come off a little bit this year. Uh, and then longer term, we think there could be a very interesting period where platinum and palladium and rhodium prices spike higher for at least a brief period of time. And platinum and palladium are interesting because they're the bridge between the precious metals and the energy metals. Right now, 60% or so of platinum and palladium and about 80 or 90% of rhodium goes into auto catalysts to clean up the emission. And insofar as the automotive propulsion technology is up for a change over the next three or four decades, platinum and palladium could lose out to other metals as we see a change in auto technology. Energy metals, some key points here. First off, there's a great deal of uncertainty as to what future energy technologies will be. And I'll go through these things in greater detail in a minute. The metals markets are running ahead of reality. There's a lot of expectations that electric vehicles are going to be the motive propulsion of the choice in the future, and that they're going to be taking big chunks of the market. You'll hear people in the lithium mining development space talk about how in 10 years, electric vehicles may represent 15% of new car sales. If you talk to people in Detroit, in the auto industry, not only in Detroit, but in Tokyo and Seoul and in Europe, they two years ago were saying maybe five or 6% of the new vehicles would be electric vehicles in a decade. Now they're saying maybe seven or 8%. So the auto industry, thinks that its pace of migration to electric vehicles will be roughly one-third of what the lithium mining development people say. The investment community has gotten too far ahead. And there's a lot of uncertainty as to what will really be going on. So I look at a lot of the mining developments in lithium and in cobalt, magnesium and vanadium with a great deal of caution because it's not clear what the, develop, uh, what the technologies are going to require. So let's look at precious metals. Here are my specific price expectations. Now first I want to say, last year was a very interesting year. Gold, at the annual average price of gold rose 0.7%. So gold producers were very disappointed last year. Gold was flat. Gold jewelers were very happy because gold was flat. But on a point-to-point -point basis, from the end of 2016 to the end of 2017, gold rose 14%. Stock market, the S&P, rose 22%, which distracted a lot of investors away from gold and silver and alternative assets. But the reality is that gold's price increase point-to-point -point was one of the four large, really sterling performers 
over the course of 2017. Now, when you look at 2013, uh, 2018, we think the annual average price will rise about 2.3% to about 12.88. So much stronger than last year, and most of that increase in the second half of the year. And in 2017, we're looking for price accelerating even more sharply. We're looking for about a 6.5% to 7% increase in the annual average price in 2017, 2019. Longer term, the gold market and the economic environment in which we all live, which drives gold, the gold market, is setting itself up for another spike, similar to the one we saw in 79-80, similar to the one we saw in 2007-2011. Not sure when it's going to come. It may be 2022-2024, but I would not be surprised to see record prices in gold with annual average prices around $2,100, $2,200, six or seven years down the road. But I don't think that the economic and financial problems will be sufficiently negative to cause investors to drive into gold sufficient to drive that price higher for a couple years, at least. It's hard to say because you don't know how that's going to, to develop, and obviously politics come in. What's likely to cause prices to rise? Well, strong investment demand, the economic and financial and political factors that cause investors to want to buy large amounts of gold and silver, continued central bank buying, and a decline in mine production after next year. Silver prices averaged about $17 last year, 17.18, flat from the year before. 7.2% increase from the beginning of 2017 to the end of 2017. We're looking for about a 3%, 4% increase to about 1774 on an annual average basis this year, with prices accelerating in the second half of the year. And in 2019, we think the prices might start to rise very sharply. We think silver's fundamentals are stronger than those of gold in some ways, so that the increase, the sharper increase that we expect in silver prices may emerge before uh, it starts to emerge in gold. And on a longer term basis, we wouldn't be surprised to see 43 or 44 dollars annual average price 2023, 2024. And that compares to $35 annual average price that we saw in 2011 when the intraday price peaked at $49 and some odd cents. Looking at the factors that drive it, first, the dollar is neither dead nor dying. It could die. Politicians are working very hard, it seems, to kill it. But the reality is that for the dollar to die, you have to believe in the wherewithal of European politicians. Because it's the euro and the pound and the Swiss franc that have the liquidity to compete with the dollar. And those countries are in the same economic situation that we are in, in many cases, in some cases worse. So the dollar isn't going to go away. But that's okay because the dollar and gold, gold doesn't actually trade against the dollar. It's investment demand. And you can see here, the black bars are years in which investors bought more than 20 million ounces of gold. And it used to be things would get bad politically or economically. Investors would buy more than 20 million ounces of gold. They'd drive the price up. Things would get better after a year or two. They'd stop buying that much gold. They wouldn't necessarily sell their gold, but they'd buy less, and the price would come off. Since 2001, 2002, we have seen investors buying 20, 30, 40, 45 million ounces of gold. They pulled back in 2013, 2014 to less than 20 million ounces, and the price of gold fell. 2015, 2016, 2017, they started buying 20, 27, 25 million ounces of gold, and the price started rising again. There's a big shift underway. People who used to buy gold out of fear are buying less gold. People who buy gold out of greed because they think that the gold price is going to rise and they want to make money in gold instead of preserving their wealth are buying more gold. It's ironic because I think that we're in the worst time politically and economically since World War II, worse than 2007, 8, 9. And it's funny that people who bought gold out of fear of economic problems are backing away probably as those economic problems grow worse. If you look at coin demand, 
Those are people who buy gold to hold it in their hands. These are fear buyers. Gold coin sales fell 67% last year. Investors were buying less gold out of fear. If you look at gold ETF investors, they bought more gold in 2016 and 2017. These are people who are buying gold through ETFs because they want to buy and sell. They're looking to make profits as well as protect themselves from economic adversity. So the greed investors, the people who buy gold for capital appreciation purposes, are buying more gold, while the fear investors are buying less gold. You also saw record volumes in gold futures and options on the COMEX. Chinese investors have been steadily buying more gold over the last couple of years. These are investors buying gold because they think the price is going to rise. Indian investors have been buying less gold for the last decade, since 2006, 2007, because they tend to buy gold more out of fear. So you're seeing this shift. Equities, not bitcoins, are what's distracting investors from gold. If you look at this, the cryptocurrency market is about $720 billion in size. That's that little dot. There were fewer than a million people estimated to be investing in cryptocurrencies worldwide. The gold market's a multi-trillion dollar market, and the gold derivatives market is multi-trillion dollars, with billions of people buying and owning gold worldwide. What's happening is you've seen gold uh, equity prices rise steadily in the United States at least for years, and especially last year, up 22% on the S&P with historically low volatility. And investors are moving away from gold into stocks much more than they are moving out of gold into cryptocurrencies. Clearly, some speculators, some pachinko parlor players, are moving into cryptocurrencies. But if you're looking for long-term capital appreciation and preservation, you're not moving into cryptocurrencies because that's a formula for losing money. You're moving into the stock market. Silver, very similar to gold. And we can see we had this big increase from 2006 into 2011. Since that time, we've come down, but we still have a lot of investors buying silver. Let me talk about energy metals because I'm almost out of time and I, and I wanted to have questions. It's not clear which propulsion technology is going to win. It's not clear that electric vehicles will be the cars of the future. It's not clear what metals are going to be needed. Lithium could be replaced by calcium ion batteries. Toshiba has a tungsten uh, titanium battery that they, they announced a couple years ago. People are looking at all kinds of technologies. Tesla is spending $40 million a year on non-lithium battery research. Lithium may not be the propulsion, the battery of choice, even if electric vehicles do come along. Cobalt can be replaced by nickel sulfide already in, in lithium batteries. Fuel cells don't make sense. And even if they were, there are platinum-free fuel cells now. Hydrogen is an interesting thing. So you look at the propulsion technologies and you say, which one's going to win? Right now we have gasoline and diesel. Compressed natural gas, which actually makes a lot of sense, but people don't use it for uh, private cars because of the distribution and charging and filling system and safety issues. Electrics, hybrids. I should tell you, in 1979, I wrote a book on electric and hybrid vehicles. Uh, it's a collector's item right now, and it's actually an uh, uh, issue of currencies. Fuel cells don't make sense. I'm very interested in hydrogen engines. We're looking at a company, we're working with a company that actually has the capacity to hydrogenate a simple organic liquid and move that uh, hydrogen in a safe, secure way using the existing systems for distributing and storing and using gasoline and diesel. Uh, if I'm an auto company and I say it costs me $3,000 to build a diesel or a uh, gasoline engine, and I want to move to electric vehicles, and that power plant costs $10,000, or more than three times as much as an ICE engine, that's a big economic disadvantage for me and for my customers. If I want to talk about going to fuel cells, and that power plant costs $30,000 and is technologically unreliable and, and un, uh, uh, scary, it's even worse. If I can go to a hydrogen engine, 
which were proven out decades ago, those cost $1,500, half of what a gasoline engine costs. The first internal combustion engine was built in 1806 and used hydrogen. 50 some odd years before petroleum started to be produced commercially in Pennsylvania. So hydrogen engines could be the wave of the future. They're not there yet. And we may see go that the, the automotive market goes from gasoline and diesel to electrics, and then from electrics to hydrogen engines. It wouldn't be surprising. That may be the most likely scenario. Fuel cells, these big bars are the estimates that the platinum industry has put forth since 1980 about how much platinum would be used in fuel cells. You know, 300, 400, 500, 600,000 ounces a year by various years. And those little black bars are the 10, 20,000 ounces of platinum that's actually been used in fuel cells. Fuel cells have a future in certain fleets like uh, forklifts and, and airport fleets, but they don't have a future for on-the-road vehicles. It's going to take a long time. These things are going to evolve. We did our, we usually do our 10-year projections. We took them out uh, 33 years to 2050 for it to happen. Platinum, we think, will be good in the next decade because you'll see South African platinum and palladium production falling before the auto industry use goes away. Same is true there. Let's open it up for questions. We have only about two, two and a half minutes. Any questions? And otherwise, thank you. If you have questions, please use this. Yes, sir.